So turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. Uh, we're calling that Luke volume 2 because Dr. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. He also then wrote volume 2, which is the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, Dr. Luke, when you put Luke and Acts together, wrote more of the New Testament than any other author. We're coming to the place in the book of Acts where the kingdom of God begins to expand. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said that you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, then working out in Judea, then working out into Samaria, and then even through the remotest parts of the earth. And as we look at how Luke records the expansion of the church, you might be surprised to learn it wasn't through a highly organized outreach program. Nor was it through highly trained professionals. It was through ordinary Christians living ordinary lives, sharing the good news of Jesus during their ordinary days. It seems sometimes that the unchurched people expect the church to prioritize witness even more than we do. It seems that they're sometimes and oftentimes more ready for us to share the good news than we are to actually share it. There is an illusionist routine, very famous, called Pen and Teller. Uh, Penn Gillette is the pen and Raymond Teller is the teller. And uh, they're very popular. They headline out in Las Vegas. Uh, Penn Gillette is actually an atheist. He actually wrote a book uh, saying, No God. Uh, N-O, no God. But after one of their shows, a businessman came up and gave Pendulette a Bible. Pendulette was so moved that he actually did a video blog. Some of you have seen this, but it is so good and so relevant and so powerful that it's worth watching again. An atheist saying... If you believe, you have the answer to eternal life, and you don't talk about it, how much do you have to hate somebody? That's like having the cure for cancer and keeping it all to yourself. Do we believe that by God's grace, He has given us the answer to eternal life? And did you notice how many times he said, and he was sane? <laughs> like, like most of us are just crazy. But, it, but his point was, he was a normal person. This was a businessman. He wasn't getting paid to share his faith. And he was engaging. That's the way the early church spread the gospel not through outreach programs, not through trained professionals, but ordinary Christians living ordinary lives, sharing Christ in ordinary ways. Let's see how Dr. Luke puts it. Stand and follow along with me as I read the second uh, part of verse 1 all the way through verse 13. This is God's Word. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, notice here now, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered, who is that? That's everyone except the apostles. Those who were scattered, normal, sane Christians went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw all the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. 
But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles he performed, he was amazed. May God bless the hearing and teaching of his inspired, infallible, inerrant, and authoritative word. Church of God. This is God's Word, and He's given it to us in part that we might be equipped and mobilized to share the good news with everyone we come into contact with. Let's pray. Father, we read Your Word. We see how the early church spread the gospel. Father, would you grant your grace that we might be a church that spreads the gospel as well. To your glory, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So the passage reveals that the early church spread the gospel through ordinary Christians, through homemakers, through seamstresses, through laborers, shepherds, craftsmen, artisans, musicians, business owners of all kinds, politicians. And in our day, Jesus hasn't changed his strategy. His method for reaching the world with the good news continues to be doctors, lawyers, dentists, salespeople, teachers, homemakers, musicians, artists, engineers, whatever our vocation is, whatever it is we do, wherever we live, God's method primarily for reaching the world is through untrained people who bring the good news. If you look at the back of the weekly, uh, every week on that weekly is, is printed our mission statement for Oak Mountain. Our mission is engaging every neighbor with the surprising power of grace. And then we've added over the fence of our neighbor's backyard, over the mountain into the city, and overseas. And our strategy for accomplishing that is threefold. We will engage every neighbor with the surprising power of grace as we learn to seek grace from God, share grace in community, and show grace to all. How do we learn to show grace to all? Three lessons from the first century church. First of all, become more aware of divine engagements, divine appointments, divine opportunities. Become more aware. They're around us all the time. As a matter of fact, God is setting up divine engagements for all of us if we were simply be aware of it. There's four kinds of divine engagements revealed in this passage. First of all, look at verse 1. There arose that day a great persecution against the church, and all were scattered except the apostles. God is sovereign over how he chooses to scatter or disperse his church, his people. It's like we're gospel chess pieces and God moves us wherever he chooses in order that we might have gospel engaging conversations with others. Verse 4, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Now, that word preaching is not like you would hear a sermon. You don't have to be seminary trained to share your faith. Literally, the Greek says, those who were scattered good newsed the word. Okay? All we're called to do is talk about the good news of grace in Jesus Christ. See, vocational ministers staff what we call the aircraft carrier. If you notice, 
the title of this morning's message is the HMS OMPC, His Majesty's Ship, Oak Mountain Presbyterian Church. And in our church, we like to use the imagery of an aircraft carrier. This is an, a spiritual aircraft carrier. And all of us have, as Christians are scattered throughout the week. And as we seek to live for the glory of Christ, we get shot at, we get bloodied, bruised, dented, we running out of fuel, we come flying in, we can barely come in stable, and we catch that wire, we halt to a stop, we get out, and in the church, the aircraft carrier, we get refueled, retooled, refreshed, then we get back in our planes and are catapulted out to fly mercy missions of love and search and rescue missions. And the vocational staff, they're the ones that staff the aircraft carrier. We're supposed to make sure, my job, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, is to make sure the saints, that's you, the saints get equipped for the work of ministry and then are mobilized. Now, God scatters us and mobilizes us sometimes in very surprising ways. In this passage, it is through persecution. God allowed a persecution to arise that forced people away from their homes into other towns, other cities. Now, we may not experience that kind of persecution but we do face troubles, don't we? We do face trials. We do face difficulties. We do face suffering. Has it ever occurred to you that the suffering that you might so deeply resent is actually a means of God giving you divine engagements to talk to other people who also have troubles? I'm firmly convinced that when the world faces suffering and brokenness, that God also entrusts some of his children with that particular kind of brokenness and suffering so that people in the world can tell a difference between how people without Christ face trouble and people with Christ face trouble. What are you facing this morning? Trouble, difficulty, distress that very often God means to be a tool to lead to divine engagements. And then secondly, another kind of divine engagement, look at verse 2. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. If you hear last week, we talked about Stephen being stoned for preaching the gospel, and a man named Saul, who would soon become Paul, is the ringleader well, you need to realize that in the first century, Jewish leaders forbade lamenting someone who was executed for blasphemy. See, they, they stoned Stephen because they thought he was speaking blasphemy by saying Jesus was God in the flesh. So these people who buried Stephen and lamented for him, they were taking great personal risk. They were going against what the Jewish leaders said ought to be done. And very often, God puts us in situations where He calls us to step out and take risks in order to have divine engagements, divine opportunities arise. I'm mean, thinking of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember them? Three friends of Daniel. They were commanded to bow to a golden statue that Nebuchadnezzar uh, had formed, and they refused to bow. That was risky behavior. And when they refused to bow, Nebuchadnezzar wanted them thrown into the fiery furnace. But Jesus was there in the fire protecting them. And it led to a divine engagement, a divine opportunity, a divine appointment to share the power of the God of grace. Or Daniel. In the same book, Daniel was forbade to pray, and yet he prayed anyway. As a result, he was thrown into the lion's den. But God protected him, and it led to a divine engagement, a divine appointment 
where Daniel was able to share his faith. What are some risks, whether it's speaking words or engaging in certain activities? Look, I'm, I'm not telling you to go out there and get fired. That would just be silly and foolish. But, but short of that, how, how is God calling you to take some risky action that would lead to divine engagements? And then thirdly, look at verse 3. Saul tries to destroy the church and he puts men and women in prison. Now, we don't want to spend any time in prison, but... All throughout Scripture, God uses prison as divine engagements, divine appointments. Think of Joseph. Joseph was unjustly imprisoned, and yet he was faithful to God in the midst of it, and it led to a divine engagement, divine appointments. Now, you may not be facing literal prison, but there are different kinds of prisons, There are emotional prisons, prisons of despair, prisons of anger, prisons of worry and anxiety. What kind of prison are you facing this morning that you actually resent when in fact God might want you to use that prison? as an opportunity for divine engagement. So many of us think, if I was just out of this prison, this prison of bad health, or this prison of just a spiritual whatever, that then I could be effective as a witness. What if the thing you resent is actually the means of your effective witness? And then the fourth kind of divine engagement are people that we meet simply throughout our weeks. In verse 9, it talks about Simon the magician. I think that's interesting in light of us talking about Penn Jillette and the illusionist. You have Simon the magician. Now, what's interesting about Simon is, is you, if you read the rest of the chapter, Simon here appears to give his life to Christ. But the more you read Acts chapter 8, the more you can begin to doubt that he's genuinely converted. In other words, he professed faith in Christ and was even baptized. But it's a question as to whether he truly possessed saving faith. Now, this is particularly important in Birmingham. I happen to believe that a very high percentage of people in our city who profess to be Christians do not actually possess saving faith. Look, grace changes lives. If there is not a life change, then there has not been grace. But you have all these people running around because they made a profession, they walked an aisle, they joined a church, they grew up in a Christian home. And how many of those people do we have opportunities to engage in conversations every week? Think about all the divine engagements and appointments God sets up for you with people who think they're Christians, but they're not. And then at the end of chapter 8, we see that the angel, an angel of the Lord and the Holy Spirit lead Philip to run up to a chariot where there's an Ethiopian eunuch and he's reading the Bible, but he doesn't understand it. Now, you probably won't have an angel tell you to go speak to somebody. But how many of us know people that are actually reading the Bible and don't understand it? How many of us know religious people that are engaged in religious activities, but they don't know Jesus? And how often does God set up divine engagements for us to talk to those people? We all have appointment books. Mine sort of went through an evolution. I started with writing with ink on my hand. That was my appointment book. That was back in college. Then I graduated to a day timer. Then I read uh, Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and I used the Franklin Covey Day Planner. And then I went to high tech and bought a Palm Pilot. I'm dating myself, but some of you actually remember those things. 
And now I have all Apple devices and they all sync and I have iCal and it's nice and my assistant can also follow what I'm doing. Laurie can follow what I'm doing. It's filled with engagements. Now, I don't know about your engagement book, but I often find that my engagements don't always end up the way I thought they would. My meetings and appointments don't always go the way I thought they would. Do you know why that is? Because God also has an engagement book. And it overlaps and supersedes my engagement book. And all of my engagements, all of my appointments, and all of yours, there is more going on than meets the eye. And in every one of those engagements, whether it's through our attitudes or our actions, or yes, eventually even our words. God is moving chess pieces. He is scattering His church, us, so that the good news might be proclaimed. Let me give you two applications uh, from this first point. First of all, when you wake up, when you make your coffee, when you have your breakfast, just say an easy prayer. Lord, open my eyes to the divine engagements that you've sovereignly appointed for me today. In other words, let me look at my appointment book in view of your appointment book. Open my eyes to divine engagements. I just ask you to do that. You'll be amazed at what happens. Then secondly, if you're struggling, just pause and ask yourself, how is this struggle, how is this trial, trouble, distress How has it been sent so that God might actually provide divine engagements to talk about the good news? Become more aware of divine engagements. God is always at work around you all the time. Secondly, become more compassionate toward every neighbor. Look at verse 5. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Now, I don't know if you know anything about Samaria, But Samaria was the capital of the northern ten tribes of the divided kingdom. After David and Solomon, Solomon's son Rehoboam didn't lead well, and the kingdom divided. Ten tribes to the north had Samaria as the capital, and then two tribes to the south with Jerusalem as the capital. The northern ten tribes never had a good king. They were all wicked, and people follow the leader. And so the people became wicked. And God disciplined his people, the northern ten tribes, by bringing in the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians conquered Samaria and settled in Samaria. So the Jews that were in Samaria intermarried with the Assyrians. And the resulting mixed race were called the Samaritans. And the Jews looked down their noses at the Samaritans. This is why Jesus shocked the woman at the well in John chapter 4. She was a Samaritan. She said, how is it that you being a Jew and a Jewish man would talk to me, a Samaritan and a Samaritan woman? Why did Jesus do that? Because in Matthew 9, it says, when Jesus looked at the crowds, he saw them as distressed and downcast, like sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion on them. And the first century Christians looked past the ethnic issues of being Samaritan and simply showed compassion. The marginalized, the outcast. Who are the Samaritans in our day? Who are the Samaritans that you come into contact with? that maybe society or or perhaps Christian culture looks down on. And God says, no, you show compassion. You share the good news with them. You know, do we really believe people are lost? I'm going to ask you, do you really believe there is a God? Do you really believe that humanity's rebelled against him? Do you really believe he's a God of justice? Do you really believe that one day anyone who does not know Christ will be eternally separated from God in a place of eternal torment? Do you believe that? Do 
Do you believe that there's only one life? And your only hope for knowing Christ is in that one life. And if you die without Christ, there is no second chance. There is no other opportunity. This life is it. This is the only hope you get as far as trusting in Christ. After that, you're eternally separated from God in a place of eternal torment. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is the good news? That, that through Christ we can be forgiven. Through Christ we can know God. Through Christ we can become all that God's ever wanted us to be. Do you believe that? Then how much do we have to hate somebody to have that and not talk about it? It's like Penn Jillette said, at some point, and you realize a truck is coming at somebody and that person doesn't see that truck, at some point you tackle them. There may be bruised ribs and they may be upset with you for a while. But now is not the time for timidity, folks. Look at verse 7. More compassion. Unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. Do we see people around us as under the power of the evil one? Look, don't look at Hollywood and the exorcist and look for people that are possessed. No. If anyone doesn't know Christ, they are under the power of the evil one. They're in bondage to the devil. Where's our compassion? Verse 7, many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Do we have compassion for the hurting? Do we have compassion for those who are physically distressed? Okay, maybe we do. But what about the people who are spiritually paralyzed? Paralyzed by fear. Paralyzed by worry. Paralyzed by lust. Do we have compassion to share the good news with them? Or what about people that are spiritually lame? We're all spiritually lame. We're all spiritually crippled. But people without Christ have their legs cut out from under them. Where is our compassion? Then look at verse 8. The result of our compassion, there was so much joy in the city. Again, folks, this is good news. This isn't like, you know, forcing castor oil down people's throats here. This is good news. This brings joy. This brings life. Why don't we talk about it? Well, people might be offended. Yeah, they might, but they got a truck coming after them. Where's our compassion? A few years ago, there was a movie that Kevin Costner was starring in. Uh, it was called The Guardian. It's about the Coast Guard and how the Coast Guard search and rescue teams are trained. You know the motto of the Coast Guard search and rescue teams? So that others might be saved or so that others might live. That, that should be the motto of the church. Engaging others with a surprising power of grace so that others might live. I'm going to give you an application here. All of us, or not maybe not all of us, most of us are going to go to the beach this summer. You go to the beach, you almost always see at some point while you're there this orange and white helicopter flying up and down the coast. It's the Coast Guard. They're looking for people in trouble. We're the aircraft carrier. You come in here to get refreshed, refueled, retooled, and then you fly off. It might be a helicopter, it might be a jet. But you fly off for search and rescue missions. Laurie and I, we must be right under the flight path of one of the life flight helicopters. Um, it's either from Children's or UAB. I don't know which, which one it's from. But every time I see it, my heart sinks, and I pray for who's ever in the helicopter. But after this week and preparing this message, I'm going to change my prayer. I'm still going to pray for them, but I'm going to start praying for me. God, Help me to be more aware of those around me who need search and rescue. Help me be more aware of divine engagements. 
Next time you see a Coast Guard helicopter, will you become more aware as well? Then thirdly and finally, we not only uh, must become more aware of divine engagements, become more compassionate toward every neighbor, we also need to become more thankful for surprising grace. Look, we're only going to share our faith. We're only going to talk about Jesus if we're excited about Jesus. So I ask you this morning, how excited are you about Jesus? It's a very simple question. Look at verse 12. Philip shared the good news of the kingdom of God and the good news of the name of Jesus Christ. Do you believe it's good news? That's my big question for all of us this morning. Do you believe the gospel is good news? Let me put it a different way. What do you believe is the greatest thing that's ever happened to you in your entire life? Don't give me the Sunday school answer. I don't want the Sunday school answer. I want the truth. What do you believe is the greatest thing that's ever happened to you in your life? If you believe the greatest thing that's ever happened to you is giving your life to Christ, then why would we hold back from sharing with others the greatest thing that's ever happened to us? Knowing that as we offer it and if they respond, it will be the greatest thing that's ever happened to them. We need to become more thankful for surprising grace. As we begin to reflect more and more on all that is ours in Christ, we become more thankful for grace. We become more excited about grace and we'll be more ready to share about Jesus. January 4th, 2018. I'm sorry, January 14th, 2018. The Minneapolis Miracle. If you're a football fan, you know what I'm talking about. Minnesota Vikings, New Orleans Saints, divisional playoff. Minnesota was ahead the whole game. Drew Brees brings back New Orleans, and they're ahead with just a little bit of time on the clock. As a matter of fact, Case Keenum subbing in because other quarterbacks have been injured. Case Keenum has one last play, the quarterback of the Minnesota Vikings. He calls a play which ironically was named Buffalo Wright 7 Heaven. It was the last play of the game. If they don't score, they lose. Case Keenum drops back, chucks a pass to the sidelines. It's way too high. The Minnesota Vikings receiver jumps as high as he can, grabs it. He jumps so high, it throws the timing of the New Orleans Saints defensive back off. He misses the tackle. When the receiver turns around, there is nothing between him and the end zone. With time literally running out, he crosses the end zone. Minnesota wins. Minneapolis goes berserk. Crazy. Fans all over the field, they find Case Keenum, the quarterback, who's a Christian. Fox Sports announcer grabs him. He says, what do you think about this? Keenan says, I'm speechless. The Fox Sports announcer says, where would you put this in the great moments of your life? And without missing a beat, Case Keenum said, you know, I'd have to say I'd put it third. Fox News sports guy's like, what? He says, yeah, the greatest moment of my life was the day I gave my life to Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. I mean, there are millions of people watching this. Second greatest moment of my life was, was the, the day I married my wife. This is third. What would you say was the greatest moment of your life? If, like Case Keenum, it's the day you gave your life to Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. As an atheist once said, how much do you have to hate somebody? to have eternal life and not share it with others. 
Look, this isn't to guilt you. This isn't to shame you. This is to get you to think, reflect, to call you to more. I struggle with this as much as y'all do. But I can tell you, it wasn't even a friend who led me to Christ. It was a guy I'd never met. And if he wouldn't have come to my fraternity house that January day in 1980, I shudder to think where I'd be. And why are you here? At some point, somebody shared the gospel with you. And I would venture to say that day was the greatest day of your life. And if you don't believe it now, you will one day. There are trucks coming at people. And if they don't know it, we need to find a winsome way to tackle them and talk to them about the greatest news that could ever be shared. You know, ultimately, Oak Mountain's not the aircraft carrier. Jesus is. And we fly into him, even afraid of sharing our faith. And he graciously refreshes us, refuels us, retools us. He graciously scattered us. He graciously sends us out and says, you can do this. You can. For I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, we all confess that uh, it feels like our mouths are wired shut at times. God, there's not one adopted son or daughter in here today in your family who doesn't know we're called to share the good news, to spread the gospel. And yet, Lord, few of us do. So forgive us and grant us an excitement about Jesus ourselves. God, we're going to talk about what we're excited about. We always do. So get us excited about Jesus and help us to talk to others about him and your great, great love offered in him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.